Hello and welcome to Conway Video. Uh, so in this video I want to do a book review and um, I thought I'd start my first book review with my favorite book. This is uh, the, the, I think the best book on programming, on software development that I've ever read, uh, that I've ever owned. So without further ado, I want to do a book review on this book and this is A Philosophy of Software Design by John Osterhout or Osterhout, I don't quite know how you pronounce it. but um, yeah, this uh, this book is awesome. Uh, it's small. I like that. It's not huge. It's not terribly complicated and big and daunting. It's a small book and that means that I can read it many, many times and the ideas really, really sink in. And I've found this book to be um, an absolute godsend. It's practical, but it's also philosophical. So it gives you a powerful but small set of ideas and I've found that those ideas can be reused again and again on projects and um, in different projects too, in a wide variety of scenarios. I've found the principles and the ideas in this book to be uh, extremely helpful and useful. Um, and there's some stuff about the author that I find interesting too. So this guy, John Osterhout, he's not um, particularly trying to sell a company or a brand. He's not trying to sell a consultancy. Uh, he's also not trying to sell a particular product. Um, I think he invented some um, popular programming libraries back in the past, but at the moment, at any way, he's not trying to sell any particular product or tool. So right from the bat, right off the bat, right from the start, he's not trying to sell you anything. Um, or at least he is trying to sell a book, I suppose, but you know, he's, um, I get a feeling he's got a bit more of an objective, unbiased opinion and he's, his focus therefore is also a little bit broader and he looks at, I think, a broader set of concerns than just what's trendy at the moment or what's going to sell a certain vendor product or something like that. In fact, if you listen to his interviews on uh, Google Talks, on, on YouTube or whatever, he's got some, um, or not interviews, uh, I should say lectures. He's got a number of lectures and he actually talks about what he does day to day and I find it fascinating. He is a professor, but he is teaching a class which is a new class that he's created himself at Stanford. And this class is just about um, I forgot the exact name, but it's about software construction. And basically in this class, it's not theoretical, it's not math, but the students actually write programs. They write real programs, they solve real problems, and um, it, it's divided into phases. And so the students will build one kind of application in the first phase, and then they'll all look at the code and he'll review the code and he'll mark the code, just like an assignment in, in university. And so right then and there, the students are getting quick feedback on their code. Um, just like a code review in a real job. And so, and he's using the principles in this book to actually teach them um, by example, to show them the parts in their code that could be done better and how they could be done better. And so I think that's a brilliant way of teaching people programming. And uh, he's got this class that he does and yeah, there's multiple levels. So they'll build one program and then they'll move on to a high level and build something a bit more complicated and so on until they get to the end of the class. Um, so anyway, let me get right into the review of the book. So. Um, I'm just going to dive in. Uh, it, it, as you can see, it's a pretty small book. It, it's not huge, but there is a lot. I think it is huge in the terms of depth and in terms of breadth and in terms of the, the, just the power of some of the concepts. And these are really, they're simple concepts, simple ideas, but so powerful, so powerful. Um, they can be used in, in so many instances. And I find myself thinking of them uh, as I develop, as I'm at my desk writing code or in a meeting designing something with, with other developers or I think about this in so many situations. So he talks about, um, what does he talk about here? So he's got, you know, uh, some introductory kind of sections in the book. Um, chapter two, the nature of complexity. Um, he talks about what, what makes a system, uh, you know, hard to understand. Um, and then in chapter three, he goes into working code isn't enough. And I love this because he goes into tactical programming and then strategic programming. And so um, he's looking at um, programming, not just in, the t in terms of how do I get this thing done? How do I make this thing work? Like so many other books are, but he's then taking a step back and thinking, well, how can the code be used as a tool to achieve broader aims, broader outcomes? And he's got this insight that it's not enough to have working code, you need code that is um, <clears throat> um, that is basically an investment that 
that compound brings compounding benefits over time. And this is such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful idea and I've seen it in so many cases. If you build a component, for example, in the UI that's really, really useful and reusable, that component can save hours, days, years of work. If you, if you build it the right way and can reuse it, then the code becomes, it gives you a kind of leverage. It becomes like um, it's automated. It becomes like a machine that you just point it and it does what you need. Same with microservices. If you can build a really well designed and well strategically placed microservice that just does does its job properly, that thing can be an investment that pays dividends and it can be worth spending actually a lot of time on a small amount of code when other people are saying, but it's such a small thing, why are you spending so much time on it? Well, if you spend a lot of time getting that thing right, then that will have compounding benefits. You'll be able to build a lot of other modules around it. You'll be able to set up a whole system around it. So I think this is something that's just uh, often not talked about enough in the industry. We're so focused on delivery, 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 and delivery is important, but sometimes uh, it's also important to think strategically. Um, you know, think a bit, thinking more like a military general than just like the infantrymen. You know, sometimes you do need the soldiers. You do need to be a soldier sometimes and go and shoot the enemy. But sometimes you've also got to be a bit of a general and think, well, you know, what's this? What's going to happen in six months? What's going to happen in t t five years, ten years? How can we get make the make the best choices to save ourselves time? in the future and get those compounding benefits that just build upon each other. And here he's got this really nice chart that kind of just demonstrates, you know, this is just the perfect chart to me. It demonstrates exactly what he's talking about where, you know, the, there's an immediate boost to the tactical way of thinking, but the strategic way of thinking pays off uh, in the longer term. Uh, absolutely brilliant ideas. Uh, and then he gets into this idea. This is one of the, to me, one of the genius uh, ideas in the book. And it, it's not, I don't think it's an old, uh, it's a new idea, but it's just the way he presents it is really, really genius. Um, um, modules should be deep. What is an interface? And so he's bringing in this idea, which he mentions in his talks about how interfaces should be small and the, the, in, the thing that they hide, the thing that the interface abstracts should be where the complexity is, the, the thing is big. So you want, you want to have modules where the interface is very simple and easy to use. And he's got a very good definition of, of an interface as well, where you know it's the interface isn't just the parameters to the method, right? That's the easy, obvious thing. But the thing we don't often think about is the interface is much more than that. The interface is also uh, things like how uh, how we call it and how it works. Um, you know, for example, what happens if there's an exception? What what exceptions does this method throw? Those are also part of the interface. Or um, you know, how often do you, can you call this method? Can you call it hundreds of times in a second and get, you know, get a, a fast response from it? That's also part of the interface. So it's, he's really challenging us to think beyond just, you know, an interface is a method with parameters and these are the parameters and that's that. And, you know, he's challenging us to think deeper. You know, what's, there's much more to an interface than just that. And so we have to take those concerns into account. But yeah, he talks about, you know, um, he's got these sort of red flags throughout the book. And one of them is that, you know, shallow modules. You shouldn't have pieces of the code that, um, that that don't really do much and that just make the code more complex. They serve no purpose. And he gives, the, you know, a very, uh, very silly and uh, um, kind of extreme example of a method where it's, it, it takes more characters of code to invoke the method than it just does just to do what the method does. So you might as well, as well rip the body out of the method and just put it right there and just, just copy and paste the code right there. So... And then uh, information hiding, and this is uh, this is also perfect because he's bringing in uh, a bit of, uh, I'd say, design um, design thinking or design principles here. Um, information hiding is uh, a concept that's been around in um, inter uh, interaction design, uh, with design in the design world generally. And so he's also another thing I love about this guy's way of thinking is he's taking ideas from design and bringing them into code, and that's very important because we can learn a lot from design. Uh, in a lot of ways, we are designers. We are, we're, we're telling the computer what to do, but we're doing that in a way that other people are going to have to deal with and look at and interact with. They're, other people are going to have to read the code, modify the code, debug the code. So we're also designers as well as developers. We have to design the code to be modifiable, to be maintainable, to be efficient as well and performant and, and uh, so many things. So, you know, uh, right off the bat, there's a good design principle, information hiding. Um, Again, you know, simple interfaces that hide all the complexity. 
so that when you look at the, the, the interface, you know what it does. You don't have to know all the details. You don't have to know every line of the method just to call the buddy method. That's really important. Um, and uh, general purpose modules are deeper, chapter six, uh, chapter seven, different layer, different abstraction. This is a brilliant concept. It actually works in, uh, sort of interleaves very nicely with also the concept of, of small interfaces and, and information hiding because then when he's talking about different layer, different abstraction, it takes a while to get your head around, but, the, but it's, a, it's really a powerful idea. Um, it's the idea that all the code that you, you put together in one place should be on the same level of abstraction. So you shouldn't be, and th there are other um, authors who get a bit into this, Bob Martin presents some similar ideas, but he really, uh, John really um, kind of clarifies this and simplifies the idea. And it's really, he reduces it to its essence, which is that the code that's together in one layer should deal with one layer of abstraction. It shouldn't be dealing with, you know, going in and out of multiple layers. So, you know, instead of a code that says, say, uh, delete customer record, then uh, number, of em number of customers plus equals, plus uh, minus equals one and then put that into this field in this database and blah blah see what you're doing you've got this high level method delete customer but then suddenly you've got all this low level code that's going into the database and moving this record here and doing that there and that's impossible for people to follow you know that's people look at a method someone coming in even you coming in you know 10 days later you, or, 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 or a year later you're looking at that code and you're like well I kind of don't get what's going on here. Why it seems arbitrary? Why we've, have we got this high-level call here, and then suddenly we're going into the internals of some database field? Like it doesn't make sense. And so instead of that, you should have everything on that level of abstraction. So you should have, you know, delete customer record and then decrement customer count, or something like that, right? So all of the methods should be spelled out in a way that you they're spelling out the high level details on that same level and then you can have a level underneath that then that goes into the detail so you can have another layer that deals with database communication again this works all these concepts work together so th this concept also works together with another one that he introduces a bit earlier in the book which is um uh which is that uh uh, general purpose modules yeah here it is chapter six general purpose modules are deeper and it, again, it's a difficult concept to, to get your head around, but I think it's worth worth really reading this book, you know, again and again until you really understand it because the, this idea is powerful. And, and this is the idea that, um, I don't know if I have it quite right, but I, I think the idea is basically that, you know, um, if you have code that's on the same level of abstraction, if you put that code together, then that code will naturally be, become general purpose code. And that that's what gives you those deep modules where you have a, a simple interface and a deeper complex implementation is if you can make something more general that generally deals with database communication, say incrementing and decrementing this particular field in this particular Postgres database or something, if you can keep put all that incrementing and decrementing in this field and that field, if you could put all that together into say a Postgres wrapper, see how powerful that is. That's much more cleaner and powerful because you're putting those concerns together and those concerns are concerns that are on the same level of abstraction so all that code is going to be about dealing with the postgres fields and that sort of thing you're not going to have this sudden you know you know talking about a customer and then suddenly talking about you know postgres field i mean let's face it if someone talked in like that in normal conversation you know you'd think they're a little bit uh, got a screw loose right like you know, and so why do we code like this? We should code, if we want to think clearly and speak clearly, we should try and code clearly as well. We should put things that belong together together and that naturally can lead to general purpose modules um, because um, when the code is on the same level of abstraction, when it's dealing with the internals of a database, that, that's a module that belongs together. Whereas if it's dealing with something more abstract like customer records or how customers interact with I don't know, support professionals, those things can also go into a separate module that is also only dealing with those sets of concerns. And so that, that again, these ideas work together, general purpose modules, information hiding, you know, um, small interfaces and big implementations um, uh, and um, different layer, different abstraction, absolutely brilliant ideas. Um, pull complexity downwards. Uh, again, this is, he's actually showing you how to do this. So he's, he's saying, look at something that's really complicated and pull it into a module, into a deep module 
and then give it a very simple interface. And so, and, and yeah, he's he's talking about how the the interface, um, the the interfacing. You know, it's hard to make a simple interface. It's not easy. We have to think a lot about it. It's not just make a smaller number of methods. It's you know things like um, what exceptions will the uh, interface flo uh, throw? You know, what's the context in which it will be called? What other interfaces will it interact with, and, and so on. Um, yeah, better together or better apart. Um, he talks about um, um, you know decomp decomposing a problem. There's that that paper um, that he refers to. I forgot the name, but it, it's a very uh, very important paper in computer science, and it, it deals with uh, decomposition of, of problems. And it gives um, uh, it gives some examples in right there in the paper of of how you could solve the same problem and break it down in two different ways, and then. Um, the, you know, the better way is suggested. Um, splitting and joining methods. Um, <clears throat> here's another one I love. This is, again, design thinking or, or design, you know, user experience design, interaction design, whatever you call it. It's, it's those ideas taken and pulled into programming. So he's got, you know, define errors out of existence. Again, this, this idea, don't make me think. Um, <clears throat> you know, don't let the, the user shoot themselves in the foot. Um, and if the user is another programmer, well, that means don't make, don't set your code up so that the programmer will encounter an exception in the first place. Just make the code so that it can only work the right way, if you can. Now, you can't always do this. That's why exceptions exist. But, you know, why throw an exception or return a null or an invalid value if you can just engineer the interface so that in the first place, the error doesn't exist and type systems can help with this and assertions and there are all kinds of ways. But he... Um, he, he's looking at also the design uh, aspect, you know, even before you start writing code, just, just step back a bit and think, is there a way to make this just work so that the user can't stuff up, so that, that the, the programmer who calls the method can't get it wrong? Um, <clears throat> design it twice. Again, iterative des design. Why are programmers not doing this? We should be doing this. We shouldn't just have one design and then, okay, let's just code it. Like, that's just ridiculous, you know? That's so narrow-minded. Like. You know what? You know it's 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 almost like um, oh, I forget the word, but it's, it's like tunnel vision, right? No, no. Step back, wait, think, try another design. You know it takes effort. It's not easy, but you should do it. You should think: is there another way to do it? And get at least two design to get, uh, designs together, and then choose between them, and f and and you know be think critically about it, and choose the better design because sometimes the there's a much better way of doing something and. If we don't just dive in and do it the first obvious way, but we we step back and think a bit about it, we can actually get a better design. And this is something designers have known for a long time, but the, but apparently programmers have taken a while to kind of catch on to it. Write comments. He gives the four excuses why people don't write comments, and I'm guilty of this myself. But you know, comments they're there for a purpose, just like exceptions. These things that were put into programming languages because the language designers knew that we would need them, and they were right. Comments we are useful, and uh, one of the beautiful things about comments that he talks about in the book that I think is just really, uh, really an awesome insight, is that comments put the documentation with the code, and really that's where it should be. It should be where people are going to use it. Again, this is design thinking. This is obvious to designers, but put things where they are going to be used. You know, if you if you're going to boil a kettle and use it to make coffee, then you'll probably put the kettle in the kitchen and the coffee in the kitchen, right? Makes sense. Why do we not do this with documentation of code? Don't put all the documentation in a big giant wiki somewhere that no one's ever going to find. Put it right there in the code and and specifically next to the method or the statement or the expression that you know that the developer is going to be working with. So it's right there. I mean, this is this is a good way of doing things. Uh, and, uh, you know, another brilliant insight that, um, you know, write the, down the comments first. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, he's, he's saying write the comments in the method of, about what you're trying to do before you even write the code. And so the comments will be kind of like the blueprint of what the code's going to be like. This, again, makes so much sense. Why do we waste time with diagrams and UML? Well, okay, maybe not waste time. I suppose these things have their place. But, you know, when you actually get down to writing the code, why not just write the documentation and the design itself right there in the code? Why not come up with, okay, I want to do this, and then I want to do this, and then I want to do that, and write them as comments first. And that will guide your mind. It will be like you've put put a stencil in your mind, and now you know where to fill in the blanks. And it will actually force you to code intentionally, to express your intention in the code, instead of getting sidetracked and going into like, 
ridiculous details or, or side effects or things that you don't really need the method to do. It'll make you focus on what the method is actually trying to do if you just write the comments first and then write the code that actually does what the comments say. And then, you know, you can delete the comments after that because they've served their purpose, right? They were just there to guide you. But you can keep the comments. And again, he, he's got this brilliant insight. I just love this. Use different words in the comments than in the code, right? So we don't want code where we don't want comments that just repeat what the code already says. What's the point of that? It's just doubling up on ourselves and, and it's useless and confusing. Instead, we want to write, use comments strategically, use comments to express the things that the code cannot express because the code just doesn't have the language to do it. That's where you use comments. Brilliant, brilliant insight. Again, I've read a lot of books and I have not seen a book that express this. That's the power of this book. It's only small. It's not even a big book, but already like, Here's, you know, I've just told you five or six just genius insights. And um, I shouldn't even say genius because I don't think it's genius that this guy has. I think it's just hard one experience. He's been in the trenches writing code, thousands, tens of thousands of lines. It's an obsession for him. He, he loves this stuff. He lives and breathes it. So any book that he's going to write is about code is obviously going to have like an enormous amount of insight packed into it that you couldn't have... Uh, you couldn't have gotten if you were doing something other than code all your life. But this guy has absolutely dedicated his, a good part of his life to the code and he's got the passion for it and it shows, it really shows. Um, okay, uh, yeah, choosing names, um, you know, you, you, a whole chapter on naming and that's good. You know, why do we have whole entire chapters about, I don't know, um, uh, exceptions, all the different kinds of exceptions or why do we have entire chapters about, you know, how to do this or that fancy thing in React, but we don't have chapters about naming. Naming is bloody important. You ha it's the hardest, one of the hardest problems in computer science, right? That's the, the, the common expression that we like to say, naming is the hardest problem, right? So, and, and so he, there we go, right off the bat, chapter 14, naming and choosing names. And uh, I don't even want to go into it because so, uh, there's so many good insights in that chapter um, that, you know, I uh, just read the book. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's got a few chapters about some other things like modifying existing code. Um, code should be obvious. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's a really important thing to remember that that, that it, it should we should try to make things plain and simple and obvious. Um, one of our biggest enemies as software developers is complexity. No, it's not that we're not using the latest version of Angular and the latest version of React and you know the event driven the event based CQRS. Um, Nginx, um, uh, whatever thing we've created isn't fast enough. The biggest enemy often is complexity. We're making, we're dealing with a complex, complex system. And so the best thing we can do is try to simplify it. And um, often the simplest thing is just to code it the most obvious way. Code it so that, you know, don't use fancy or whatever null coalescing and infix operators if you don't have to. If you can just make it into a plain if statement that expresses the code in a clear, obvious way, then you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> um, yeah, and it talks about software trends. Um, yeah, this is a nice sort of wide-ranging chapter. He, he mentions object-oriented programming, agile development, unit tests, test-driven development, design patterns. Um, that it's good to just realize that, recognize that these are trends, right? Let's just not dive right into the trend and try and make all our code conform to the trend. Let's step back a bit and just observe that these are trends in the software industry. And then maybe we can be a little bit selective and have a bit of choice and think, okay, I do want that. I don't want that, you know, instead of just, oh, oh, we've got to do it all functional programming. Oh, we've got to use the latest, I don't know, we've got to use a React, Rx, we've got to use this, we've got to use that. So let's just step back a bit and, and say, what are the trends in software, right? Duh. Anyway, you can see some of my frustration coming across in this video with the, the, the industry, but um, oh, so many good, good uh, insights. Designing for performance, again, he reminds us, and it, it's not a new idea, but it's an important idea. He reminds us that, um, we probably should, you know, build something first and get it working before we try and make it fast. Not that, it's not that we shouldn't try and make it fast. Yes, it, speed is very important these days. People click and they expect an instant response, you know, sub millisecond response. But let's first get it working before we try any fancy design pattern or any fancy algorithm or data structure that is supposedly gonna bring us performance. 
and measure, 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 measure. He's very right about that. Open those Chrome Dev tools, right? Or put those timers into your C Sharp or your Java code. You know, measure, measure, measure. Look at how fast it actually is and then use the evidence of how fast it is after your change to prove. We, what happened? Why don't we use these words like evidence and proof? This stuff matters. If you want to make it fast, especially you need to measure speed and performance because we are not intuitively, our brains aren't good at that measurement. Whereas that is one thing that computers do excel at. I'm done selling this book. I love this book. I have no vested interests in the author or the book. Um, I just bought this book. I took a bit of a punt and I'm glad I spent, I thought this was money well spent. Uh, you can get it on eBay or Amazon. I think it's actually, you can probably only get it on Amazon. Unfortunately, I, I didn't see an ebook yet, but um, anyway, hopefully he'll do an ebook at, at some point, but at the moment it's just a paperback, but um, my God, what a good book. What a powerful, small, concise, but you know, powerful and well, uh, well expressed set of ideas. And they come from hard won experience. He's not an ac academic theorist. He's not in the ivory tower. Um, and he's not one of these sleazy, I don't know, sales types who's just trying to sell you this company or this brand name or whatever. He's just a guy with a ton of experience in, in programming who teaches classes at Stanford who seems to know what the hell he's talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, The Philosophy of Software Design, John Osterhout, my first book review. Please um, leave me comments and let me know your thoughts as well. I'm always interested to hear from you all. Thank you. Bye.